Amen and amen. Well, you may be seated. Pastor had me fired up over there. And by the way, uh, I wasn't just saying that just to say that. This is how God works. I was uh, driving home from uh, Michigan yesterday, and I had to drop something off at their house. And I said, you know what? I'm across the street. I might as well just walk in. You know, and if you know me, if you give me the code to your house, I'm going to just walk in and eat. I'm just letting you know. So I said, well, his Jeep's in there. The van's in there. I was about to show up. So I just walked right up in there and was like, hey. But I was, but I was uh, sharing with him. I was listening yesterday to a podcast. And um, the podcast was talking about prosperity, but it was also talking about financial integrity. And uh, I'm listening to this, this podcast, and the Lord is just revealing some things to me. And I had walked up to his house, had no clue. And I said, Pastor, and I said, you know, there's a lot that's going on, but thank you for operating with financial integrity. And right there in his garage yesterday, this is no exaggeration, I said, I felt this in the Lord that, that someone's going to write you a $1 million check, and it's going to come. And he looked at me, he said, brother, if you only knew. So he gets up just now and says that someone wrote them, the church, a $1 million check. There's nothing greater to know when you're just not that crazy and you, and you at least get something right. You at least get something right. And so he got up. And so the moment he said that, I was a like, pastor, just preach. And pastor, so thank you Amen. for operating with financial integrity. Because how many churches... <laughs> Hallelujah. How many people would receive that and do something under their own volition? They'll use the money for different reasons. But I'm so thankful that I go to a church that whenever the blessing comes, that this church under your leadership that started with them, we operate with financial integrity. And, we're, and, and you're not out blowing the money, buying, buying her 30 purses? <laughs> Even though I know she probably wants to, by the way. But, Pastor, this is also what I want to say, and I'm just going to go back to preaching. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being a man of the Bible. Thank you for not being a man of culture. A man that looks at the color of someone's skin. A man that looks past anyone's bank account. Because just because someone has money does not guarantee them a seat on the front row. And that you look at the heart of a person and that look at all of these people, especially me, that you looked at me and said, what has God called you to do? You need to go and do it. And I'm honored to be a, just a son in the faith, to be a member of this church. And so I just want to say thank you for being a man of the Bible, not a man of culture. And the word is always the final authority in this church. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's just give let's just give the Lord an applause for our pastor. By the way, um, I don't butt kiss. By the way, in case in case you're wondering, maybe some of you're like, "Wow, he's trying to butter him up." Listen, ask my wife. I mean what I say, and I say what I mean. And I, and I, usually, if I don't have nothing good to say, I've learned through wisdom, don't give your opinion unless someone wants it. But I don't talk just to talk. And I say something, and I, and I, and I mean that. And that's 100% that's true. Thank you for living that life. Amen. Well, uh, we've been traveling. Uh, those of you who don't know me or haven't seen my face in a little bit, my name is uh, Quentin Jones. Uh, my wife and I lead the uh, young adult uh, ministry. And so uh, God, God has uh, done some amazing things. And, you know, we've been traveling uh, uh, for the last uh, two weeks or so, a uh, little, little uh, under two weeks. And, you know, we were um, shot out of here with myself, uh, Evangelist Stacy and Elijah and our families. And we went to Detroit. And I'm telling you, God did something. It's one of those things that you would have uh, had to been there to believe it. And the power of God was present in that place, and it wrecked. It wrecked that church. And something, it was almost like when the woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus, something came out of Jesus. And there was more than just a deposit, but something came out of us. And it's one of those things, I'm telling you, it was so supernatural. Hey, brother, if you can't fix up, Mike, I can grab a handheld. It's okay. Amen. Hallelujah. And so, uh, you know, God, God did some amazing things there. And then we went to uh, Invasion, 
And uh, I mean, just we brought the fire of God. It's all right. They're fixing it. You know, we're okay. We're all right. They're fixing it. They're fixing it. It's okay. Say, it's okay, sound people. It's okay. Much grace. Much grace. I actually used to be a sound guy. So, uh, you know, whenever something goes wrong, everyone turns their head like, I know it's ringing. You don't got to stare me down. Or when it's uh, Mike Paul and something's going on with Pastor Jimmy, that's when you duck your head because he's coming up there. He's coming up there and he's going to tell you how it is. Hallelujah. But um, but God, God is just so good. And it's amazing to be used of God. You know, I just want to exhort you for a moment before I uh, jump into, um, you know, my message. What is going on right now? And I say this specifically about my life and what Pastor was talking about, where the Lord is taking our ministry. What is going on right now started for me on January 1 of 2022. It was actually right after the Outcry Conference. I don't think we got home till like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And um, finally, finally went to sleep. And it wasn't just a few short hours later that the Lord woke me up after like two hours of sleep. And when he woke me up after like two hours of sleep, there was something on the inside of me that I had to sit down and I just began to write. And it was on that day of 2022 of, of January, the, the uh, new year, that there was a conception that took place. It was, you know, you know, when, when a male and a female get together and they have children, you know, that happens with conception, right? You know, it doesn't happen in any other way. And there was a conception that happened on January 1. And the Lord began to deal with my vision, not naturally, but I began to see out six months. I began to see out a year and I began to write things down that I'm now walking out right now. And there was something that the Lord was speaking. And I said, okay, Lord, I don't know what this is, but something, there was a conception. On January 27th, the fire of God came over me like never before. And it wasn't because of just a location. It was because there was such a hunger and the thirst that I wanted absolutely everything that God had. And on January 27th of this year, I felt the fire of God like I have never felt before. It's so hard to explain with my natural words. It, I, I don't even have a way to bring an analogy. You just have to take my words for it. And those who were there knows exactly what I'm talking about. Because we were there, but I can hardly remember a thing. But I felt the fire. I, it was like, it, it, it wasn't a fire like I was burning up. But it was like the Lord was burning something away. And what started in January 1 as a conception, what the Lord told me is that I'm now going through labor pains. And right there on the ground, there was a fire of God that came over me. And I heard what the Lord said, that I am the all-consuming fire, and I want to consume you. And right there on the ground, those who were there know exactly what I'm talking about. There was something, it was the labor. I'm a guy, and I know it doesn't make sense, but there was a spiritual labor that was going on. And here we are right now. And I, and I begin to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, you have used great men and women of God to do mighty exploits in your name. But see, here's the thing that the Lord had to deal with, with me about. I said, yeah, but Lord, I'm not like them. I'm not like Peter. I'm not like James. I'm not like John. I'm not even like Paul. And this is what the Lord said. It was never their power. It was never their ability. It was not their might. It wasn't even their anointing. I, it was I, the Lord, that was working with them. And God told me, Quentin, if you would stretch out your hand, I would stretch out my hand. If you would just incline your ear, I will incline my ear. If you would just go, you know that I'm going with you. And that's what it says in Mark chapter 16, that as they preached the word, Jesus showed up to confirm it. And I'm telling you, and when we 
do that. Miracles, signs, and wonders should follow you and I. God is no respecter of people. If he did it for James, if he did it for Peter, if he did it for John, if he did it for Paul, then what I do it with you. And I realized that it wasn't them. It was the anointing and the Lord was working with them. I'm telling you right now, you and I are called to perform miracles. Miracles, signs, and wonders should follow us where we go. This idea that we are unqualified, inadequate, get over yourself. Because it has nothing to do about you anyways. What we see in the Bible is merely men and women of God who yielded to his presence, to his power, to his anointing. And as they begin to pray, the Lord was praying too. As they begin to step, the Lord was stepping too. The Lord wants to work with you and I. I'm telling you right now, if you hear anything I say today, you and I are called to perform miracles. Amen. Power. Power should go. Power should flow from us. It's not my idea. I didn't make this up. This is what Jesus said about the thing. I'm talking about the power. I'm talking about when someone's in the hospital, there's something that rises up on the inside of you, and you say, give me my oil. I'm getting in the car. I'm driving there, and I'm laying hands, and you will get up. In Jesus' name, I declare this cancer to dry up right now. Do you actually believe that, or do you think it's for someone else? Do you think you're unqualified? Do you think that it's just not your time yet? Here's the reality of the situation. I realize that I'm not uh, even working solo. Because where I go, his presence goes with me. And no matter where you and I go, no matter the state, no matter the church, no matter your calling, no matter what we do, if we would just yield to him, he will work with us. And it's that simple. I'm not that good. I'm not that smart. I uh, slur my words. Sometimes I stutter. If it was about me, then it wouldn't happen. That's the beauty about the gospel because I know it's Jesus working with me. And if he worked with Peter, James, John, and Paul, I know he will work with me. And we got this. We're called to perform miracles. Hallelujah. Well, I want to talk to you today just for the next few moments about what the Lord wants to share today. And if you're taking notes, the title of my message today is trim your wick. Look at your neighbor and say, trim your wick. Don't call him a dumb wick. Just tell him, trim your wick. And if you open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 25, we're going to read from a few set of verses today. Amen. And when you are there, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your power. Glory. And this is what the Bible says. And you know what? These are, these uh, um, should be some familiar verses uh, to us. Um, this actually aligns to uh, even the uh, prophetic word that came forth from the evangelist, Stacy, and then what was confirmed by Pastor Martin. I said, man, Lord, thank you that I'm hearing something right. My goodness, I'm not that far off. Just a little bit, but not that far off. Hallelujah. Matthew 25, I'm going to read um, uh, these verses here. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamp and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all, say all. All, all those virgins rose up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there would not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. 
Later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. The title of my message, like I said, is Trim Your Wick. The ten virgins are obviously a type of the bride of Christ, of Christ awaiting for the coming of the bridegroom. And that we should not prepare ourselves, but we should stay ready for his coming. And there is a difference between getting ready and there's a difference between staying ready. And there's too many Christians who will proclaim that this is the last hour, but yet they're still getting busy right now. They, they're still trying to get their ducks in a row. They're still trying to get their finances under control. We're still trying to get everything in order. But this story is proof that there is a difference between getting ready and staying ready. And as long as we stay ready, we will be in a position that when the bridegroom comes out, we will not be in a place where we should not be. I like this parable because on one hand, we cry, Lord, Lord, Jesus, come. Lord, we want you now. Oh, God, if you would just come right now. God, if you come before my daughter gets married. Oh, Lord, God, Lord, would you just come before my son does something stupid? And we cry out with our words, Lord, would you come with our mouth? But our actions say something different. And our mouth will say, God, we want you. But the way we live, the way we think, the places to go, the things that we do, our lifestyle is actually opposite of our mouth. And so now we got this issue here that the mouth of a person says, Lord, I want you now. But our conduct, our lifestyle does not match up to that thing. Can we jump back up to verse 6? It says, but at midnight there was a shout. Behold the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all, say all. all. I'm telling you right now. I came today under the spirit of the Lord. I'm speaking to all people today. I'm not talking to one. I'm not talking to one or the other. I am talking to everyone who is hearing the sound of my voice. Whether you're here in this room or you're watching on live stream, the Lord is talking to everybody. And see, here is the thing. It's easy to, put, to pull out in the parable about those who were wise and those who were foolish. Can I say this? The indication about those who were wise and foolish only came when they went to trim their wicks. You don't know whether you're wise or foolish until you go to trim your wick. It was only after that that it was then revealed who was actually wise and who were foolish. This is why I'm telling you by the Spirit of God, I'm talking to everyone. Because whether you're wise or foolish in this place, all of us, no matter where we're at, no matter who we are, no matter our financial status, no longer, it, it doesn't matter how long we've been in this church, it doesn't matter our department, it doesn't matter our position, it doesn't matter our title out in the world, I'm talking to everyone right now. You and I have to trim our wicks. And there's four components to this story I just want to talk about here for just the next few moments. We understand that the virgins are a type of the Christian believer, which is you and I. Can I talk to you about the lamps real quick? The lamps represent the light of the world, which again is you and I. In Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 14, it says that you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord, walking as children of light. And here's my last verse for you. In Isaiah chapter 42, starting in verse 6, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light, say light to the nations, to open the blind eyes. I'm talking to you about demonstrations of miracles Amen. of the spirit and power. It's one thing to illuminate. It's another to go out into the dungeon. 
And he said to open blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from prison. You see, maybe you are here today and maybe you are either unsaved. And this is how you know that answer. If you were to die right now, do you know where you're going? And if you don't know where you're going, it's okay. We're going to give you a chance today. We're going to give you a chance to make this right because my God is a good God. And my father is a good father. And I'm telling you, there is more to life than just surviving. You and I are called to be beacons. And all of a sudden, whenever the light of Christ is lit up, now you and I understand we are the light to the nations. And we go and we help through the, under the anointing of Jesus Christ to break, op- to break the chains. And we lead people out of the dungeon, which is the same concept that Jesus descended into hell. He went to the dungeon. He took the keys. Satan doesn't even have keys to his own house. We got the keys to a house. I come in when I want to. Listen, it's like Pastor Terry. Listen, I'm here. I'm here. I'll come in right now and I'm hungry. He doesn't even have keys to his own house. He doesn't even have the authority. Uh, Jesus himself went down. And if that is symbolic to you and I, under the anointing of heaven, you and I should be going into the dungeons. Listen to what I'm saying. This, This does not mean we go to the club. It does not mean we go to the strip club. Wait, is there kids in here? Okay, maybe. Oh, hallelujah. It does not mean we go to the bar and say, let me drink with you. And then let me tell you about my Lord. I'm talking about leading people from out of the dungeon, leading them out of the darkness. And I've always found it interesting that people who want to go to the dungeon, break bread in the dungeon, and all of a sudden they themselves get shackled in the dungeon. Let us not make that mistake. Because I've heard a lot of Christians say, well, you know, um, you know, I just want to see what it's like. Yeah, okay. You see what it's like. Sin will cost us more than what, than what we want to pay. And it will keep us longer than what we ever intended to stay. Don't ever underestimate the power of sin. It's been defeated. But may we not ever underestimate the power of sin and what was already defeated. And so the lamps represent the light of the world. Let's talk to you about the oil. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. And Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Say anointed. To preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery to the sight of blind. If you are not hearing what our pastor is saying, I'm talking about demonstrations of miracle signs and wonders. If this was Old Testament verses, you might have an argument. This is New Testament, honey. This is New Testament. This is what Jesus is saying. And you and I must understand that we were called to more. We were called to greater. You and I have the anointing on the inside of us to set the captives free and help people that are blind recover their sight. It's not my gospel. It's not my message. I'm just telling you what Jesus said about the thing. I'm talking to you about the oil. And he said to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Supernatural favor. Hallelujah. And 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 27, it says, As for you, the anointing which you received from him already abides in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and it is true and not a lie. I'm going to just pause right there for a moment. You see, here's the thing. I know churches that will preach against the anointing and preach against miracles because they say it's of the devil. Now, by the way, we are kingdom people, right? Amen. We believe the Bible about a thing. And I'm telling you, I know churches even in this community that will preach the good news, but with no power. While one of my sessions I did at, at Invasion was from Mark chapter 16. And most of us know this. It's called the Great Commission. And it says to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now, This is Jesus who showed up behind a locked door 
with disciples who were afraid. And the Bible says that they were reclining at the table. So when he showed up, they were reclining because they didn't know what to do. And now Jesus, show, he, he shows up in the room and he says, this is the Great Commission. And I know almost every single church has a staple about the Great Commission. Now, here's the, the uh, interesting thing about that. Not even a verse later, two verses later, he says, go with power to cast out demons. Go that, that whether you eat or you touch a uh, deadly thing, the poison will not harm you. He says that you will help, um, help uh, those unbelievers to pray in new, uh, in, uh, new tongues. Watch, here's the last one. And you will pray for people and they will recover. Amen. Now, hold up, watch. Here's the question. It's the same Jesus, the same room, the same great commission at the same moment. How do we go into all the world and preach the gospel, but we are willing to go with no power? How in the world do we take that page and take some scissors and we cut that, that portion out? Help me understand that. It doesn't make any sense. And then you got churches who will get up and say, well, you know, tongues is of the devil. But Jesus in red letter says that they will speak in new tongues. So wait, who's a liar, me or you? I'm sorry, who's a liar, you or Jesus? Because it's red letters. I'm talking about the Great Commission. There is a fire that is on the inside of me. And I'm telling you, there's so many people in this ministry that the fire of heaven has rained down. And I'm here to tell you that the fire of hell is no match to the fire of the Holy Ghost. The fire of the Holy Ghost burns brighter, it burns hotter, and it will burn longer than anything that hell has to offer. And if you just get around someone who is on fire, it is spiritually impossible not to get hit with the wave. We're going out from this church, and listen, we all preach the same thing. Fire! Fire! The, the anointing, oil, Jesus is here to do something. And we didn't even talk about what we were preaching on. Never had a conversation. How many times do you and I write the same message? I'm like, man, what in the world is going on? I'm telling you, church, if you would just listen to what the Lord is saying right now, if you and I would just catch the fire this is a church that is on fire. And there's nothing worse to be in a church where there is men and women of God around you who is catching the all-consuming fire, is consuming us, but yet we show up to church empty. We show up to church dull. We leave the same way that we came in, and now we're lukewarm Christians. There is no way under heaven that should happen. Where we go, miracles, signs, and wonders should follow us. I'm talking about the boat. I'm talking about a confidence. It has nothing to do about me. It has nothing to do about you. What it's about is a person that will yield themselves to the Spirit of the Lord. All it requires is obedience. That's it. I was in Michigan and I saw this person in the line and I and then I was with someone and I said, and the Lord said, Man, pray for him right now. And I was like, oh man, I, I'm in Midland. With like five black people, all of us here. You know what I'm saying? Hey, I was like, hey, so man, let me look real quick. Let me. And I'm sitting there, and I felt the nudge of the spirit. I said, pray for her. And so I said, oh, okay, okay. So I went up to her and I said, you know, she was kind of like elderly. I said, um, well, just older, right? Older. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. She was, she was, she was, she was a little bit older, seasoned. Okay, she was, she was seasoned. And so I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, "Hey, um, hey, how you doing? I'm quitting. What's your name?" And she told me her name, and I said, uh, "The Lord wants me to pray for you, and um, I just have to do it. Is there anything that I can pray for you about?" And so she began to tell me what she wanted to pray about, and I said. Well, I'll tell you what, ma'am, give me your hand right now. She said, right here? I said, right here, right now. I'm going to pray for you. And right there in the Isle of Meyer, I prayed down fire right there, right there in the aisle. And she said, she said, honey, she said, uh, oh, hey, say something. 
I wish I would have thought of that. Man, Lord. Uh, I missed that one. Oh, man. And so, and so she's like, she said, honey, I'm running late, but she goes, I got goosebumps all over my body. And she just, she just walked out like that. And I was like, man, that's the anointing. I'm talking about obedience. My brother called me and he lives in uh, Germany. He texted me that night, but I was already asleep. He said, man, I'm like dog, dog sick, not sick. I'm like sick, comma, sick. And I woke up and I saw it was like six o'clock in the morning. And listen, this is what happens. This is what happens when you know there's a fire of God on the inside of you. I'm talking about obedience. And I said, well, I'm going to call him right now. And so I called him right now. He answered, and he's in bed. And I said, man, I saw your text, man. You all right? He was like, nope. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I called you right now. I'm studying, so don't talk. I'm going to pray for you right now, and I'm going to declare healing over your body right now. And he began to tell me that there was a handful, multiple people on the base who were sick with something, but they don't know what it is. And it's like bad, bad. And I, and right there on the phone in Midland, Michigan, all God is omnipresent. I'm telling you, the word, the word never comes back void, and it always prospers in the place where you send it. I couldn't get in the plane to uh, fly there, but I said, right now, I declare supernatural, God, that you're going to show up and bomb harder Germany, and Lord, the hand of the Lord is upon him. Lord, may he feel the heat of your oil running down to the bottom of his feet right now. I declare by the authority invested in me that you will get up, you will recover, and what the doctor said is a lie. Get up and receive your healing right now in Jesus' name. And I said, all right, see you later, hang up <laughs> and so the next day I talked to him I said did you receive your healing and he said bro I'm about to get up and I'm about to go run around outside right now oh my <laughs> I said get up and go do something don't wait until you feel good put your shoes on Go run outside. I'm telling you, the Lord will confirm his word. It's not mine to confirm. I don't have to fly to Germany to confirm it. All I did was walk out in obedience. I'm telling you, if you and I would just be obedient to what the Lord says, where we go will be miracles, signs, and wonders. And if you can get there, get in the car and drive there. If you can't get there, pick up the phone and call them. No more text messages. No more. And if they don't answer, you leave a voicemail. And watch this. Watch. When we take the little step of obedience and all of a sudden you're in mire and the Lord says, touch and agree right now. You and I will have no problem to do that. See, the problem is, is that we think that we have to call Pastor Terry, which by the way, respectfully, he's our pastor. But if you are listening to his teachings, he is equipping us for the work of the ministry. And I don't have to call Pastor Terry when my son is sick. I don't have to call my pastor when my children are throwing up. I don't have to call my pastor when my wife says she doesn't feel good. I grab my oil and I say, come here, girl. I'm going to declare the word right here and right now. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. If we would just walk out in the simple steps of obedience one thing at a time. And all of a sudden, what does it look like? A crazy little church in Radcliffe, Kentucky, is going to the hospitals and people are getting up out of the bed. Maybe, maybe my vision is just bigger than yours. But I'm telling you right now, there is no limit. No limit. The only limit is imagination. That's the only limit that stops the move of God. That and familiarity. Are you hearing what the Lord is saying? I'm telling you, you and I must trim our wicks. And we need the oil. And the oil is already on the inside of you and me. We just have to lean into it. And so we talked about the virgin. We talked about the lamp. We talked about the oil. Can I talk to you about the wick? The wick is a representative of the word. In John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
in John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he saw his glory, and glory as the uh, as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and of truth. Let me talk to you real quick. A lamp cannot function effectively without both oil and a good wick. There must be both. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, you should know this verse. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. In Psalms chapter 23, verse 5, it says that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed, say anointed, anointed. my head with oil, my cup overflows. In Luke chapter 7, verse 46, listen, this is a Bible church. This, this is not my idea. It's not my philosophy. There is, I, I am not that smart. This, we are a Bible church. This is a kingdom church. I'm giving you a whole lot of verses so that way someone can't say, well, this is what I think he said. This is what the Bible says about the thing. Amen. Amen. In Luke chapter 7, verse 46, it says that you did not uh, anoint my head with oil. This is Jesus. But she anointed my feet with perfume. You see, the wick, which is the word, is actually the part that makes the light. But it's useless without the oil. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 17, it says that it shall be in the last days. I'm telling you what they prophesied. I said, that is part of my message. This is how I, and listen, I had this message probably wrote about five weeks ago. And it's amazing how God just lines the, lines the, the uh, right things up. And it shall be in the last days that I will pour forth out my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. There is no age discrimination. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slave, both men and women. There is no gender discrimination. People who say that women don't belong in ministry clearly don't read the Bible. Because if, if that were the case, then how... Would the Bible say that the spirit will be poured out on both men and women? Why would the Lord pour out something for a female that he did not intend for them to use? You can't convince me of something different. We're Bible people. And I will pour out in these days my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will grant wonders, say wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, say fire, fire. Ooh, I'm telling you this the Bible already declared he said I will pour out my spirit you say Quentin, how do I catch that just get up under the faucet because he's pouring out right now you and I just have to position ourselves under the cup and he has a cup that never runs dry he, had, he said in the last days I will pour out my spirit and this is what the Lord told me in this last hour we should be seeing greater miracles, signs and wonders than what we saw a hundred years ago you know why? Because as the time has come near, the cup is going over, tilted just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. It's tilting, it's tilting, it's tilting. And in this last hour, when he pours out his spirit, it is a full emotion. Lord, I position myself under the faucet and may it run over from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet and where we go we're saturated believers with the oil I'm telling you a wick is no use without the oil the wick is actually dipped in oil and so when the fire comes the wick lights on fire but it's because it was saturated in oil Oof. You got to hear me on this. The wick is saturated in oil. You see, if you light a fire to the oil, you cause the risk of an explosion. You see, this is what happens when churches are all about the spirit and not grounded in the word. They'll do backflips off the wall. They'll start jumping like rabbits. And all of a sudden, they say that the rabbit spirit is here. This is what happens when it looks like. Jesus said, listen, we should worship in spirit and then we need both. This is a church of both. 
and it's because of the divine connections, the way that you have positioned this ministry, we need both. You can have the word without the spirit, but I'm telling you, where's the miracle signs and wonders? If you have the spirit without the word, people's doing some weird, goofy stuff. Slapping each other in the face and talking about, get out, devil. By the way, if you slap me, um, huh? Huh? Okay. Listen, I told my pastor, I said, Pastor, yeah, Pastor Marty literally threatened me the whole time in Detroit. She was like, I'm going to punch you. And she goes, I just feel like I want to punch you. And my mom, I'm like, please don't do that. Please don't do that. So then they do this call for altar, and these kids come up, and you see her just swinging. And then me and Felix made uh, eye contact, and I said, thank goodness that wasn't me. Because I said, man... She has been threatening me for two days. I'm going to punch you because the spirit said, okay? And I was like, man, she punched someone else. And the kid gets up and he's like, um, that grandma person, man, she punches hard. <laughs> this is true. This is true. This is so true. And so uh, I, told, I told my pastor, I said, uh, pastor, there's something you should know about me. And I said, you know that verse that says, turn the other cheek? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, that has not been revelation to me yet. <laughs> that is just, um, you know, logos. I read it. I understand. The bucket went down, but the bucket hasn't come back up yet, okay? So uh, my strong recommendation that you don't do that. <laughs> Let me just stop right there. Because, man, we're going to do... Listen, listen, man. I'm going to grab the Moses sandals. We're going to do an A-town stop on you. I'll tell you right now. And then we're going to repent. I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me. I'm just, I'm, I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. Me and Wash talked about this. Right, Wash? We said, listen, if, some, if something were to happen, I said, Pastor, I'm crazy. You don't have to do nothing. If you just throw something out in the spirit, I'm going to catch it with a net. And then you're going to see us just slide out the back door. We'll be right back, okay? And we're going to come, act like nothing, uh, uh, nothing ever happened. Seriously, don't do that. But seriously, I'm just confessing my faults before you, if I can just be honest. Hallelujah. And so if you take one out of the equation, you have nothing. For the wick to burn as it should, it needs to be thoroughly soaked in oil. Say oil. You and I should never light a dry wick. It will burn smoky, it will be uneven, and it will never achieve its full potential. You see, the wick will burn, but it won't ever achieve its full potential. And this is the reason why people fizzle out. It's because they will light themselves on fire for God, but without the anointing, without the Holy Ghost, without the oil, you will accomplish a thing. But you and I will simply be walking in the permissive will, not the perfect will. I want the perfect will of heaven. I understand it requires me to be soaked in the oil. I'm telling you, trim your wick. In John 15, 6, it says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. By the way, that's not a good fire. Thank you for not saying fire. That is not a good fire that you want to be thrown into. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both, both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Say all things. All, all things are open and laid bare when you and I read the word. You see, as the wick burns, there's a process. There's something that happens. It collects what I call the gump at the top. And that's the charred dead edge. This relates to the familiarity with the word. And by that, I mean what has now become common, what's now comfortable, and now we are living in complacency. We know enough of the word to get by. There's no new growth. 
Our knowledge is becoming stale, and we are no longer stretching ourselves spiritually. When a candle burns, have you ever noticed the top of it gets really charred? That's what I'm talking about. See, you and I can do great exploits of heaven, but we are called to trim our wicks because we collect the junk at the top. I want to just read this uh, quick story to you in Leviticus chapter 10. I don't have time to go into the great detail. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered a strange fire, say strange fire, before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I will be, uh, be treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. What you got to understand that these two were Aaron's oldest sons. Now, Aaron is a high priest. Here's the kicker. Aaron is a high priest who has two of his oldest sons. I would like to think that they saw him the way that things should be done. His father probably at least talked about it, about the, the reason why they have to do it. And so if you understand the uh, tabernacle, which I don't have time, there is two things. There is, there is, there is a fire that, that was about the blood, and the Lord instructed them to take this fire that was here and then bring it over here. But instead, the two sons wanted to offer strange fire, and they wanted to do things their way. They had become custom to the house of God and no longer was giving thought about what they were doing. I'm talking about familiarity. Comfort will result in a casualty. You see, we, we come to church on a Wednesday and it's just church. We come to church on a Sunday and it's just church. The moment praise and worship starts, it's okay what, you know, where I'm at, you know, I'm going to stay back here, but you know, and I know that the Lord is pulling us out. The Lord wants to do something amazing, but we are too comfortable with where we are at. We're too comfortable with taking pills. We're too comfortable with trusting the medication of the doctor. We would take medicine from a doctor we don't know for a medicine that we don't know will work. But the moment the Lord wants to do something, we question if it's real. We've got to a place where we're complacent and there's junk on the top of our wick. And the Lord is calling us to trim our wick. And like these two sons, they knew exactly what to do, but somehow they began to take advantage and they wanted to do things their way. There is a danger when you and I want to do things our way. God, I don't need you. Yes, Lord, I know what the Bible says, but this is what my mama taught me. I know what the Bible says about a thing, but this is how my, my parents, you know, uh, parented. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm talking about avoiding that which is common, that which is complacent, because you and I don't want to result in a casualty. And the Bible makes it clear that the fire that they lit, the fire of the Lord came out and consumed them. You see, a wick has to be trimmed to a sharp central point. So that way it burns the best. This shape creates the best flame as it burns around, and it gives the cleanest light. I'm talking to you about the word, like it says in Hebrews chapter 4, that the word of God is like a sword. You and I must allow the word to trim us every single day. When we wake up and our feet hit the ground, do we allow the word to trim our wick? Or do we got it? I got it all underneath control. And you see, here is the reality. The Lord wants us to burn up for him, but not burn out. See, when the wick is not trimmed, you are in danger of burning out. Especially those of you, especially that are called by God. You know that there is another calling. You know that the ministry is coming. You know that there's something that is coming. If there is anyone I'm talking to, I'm preaching to myself. Because you see, watch, we poured out. Over the last two weeks, and I have to make sure every single day, Lord, would you deal with me? May I never think I arrived. May I never think I got something smart to say. May I, may I, may I never think that I got the best word. But Lord, may I yield myself to you. 
Lord, help me to see my faults as a husband. So that I don't got it all together. Lord, may I quit blaming my wife like Adam did. Lord, may I be the husband that you desired me to be. May I be the father that you called me to be. May I put my hands to the plow. May I not come to church and just sit in the seat and just say hallelujah, amen. But may I have something on the inside of me that wants to do what God has called me to do. And God, I will not be common. I will not be complacent. But I want to do absolutely everything of what the Lord has called me to do. The Lord wants us to burn up, but not burn out. Our kingdom cannot afford any more Christians that burn out. Let me just read this last part to you. Let me tell you the reasons why we must trim. See, when you trim your wick, you can expect your candle to provide more illumination. Untrimmed wicks can cause a candle flame to take on a dull appearance. You see, how do we house the light of the Lord within us, but yet we give off a dull appearance? We're not shining as bright as we should. We must trim to wick, trim the wick to allow the flame to have a clearer and brighter burn. And trimming the wick will help the candle last longer. We must understand this principle, especially in a church like this, especially in a church where the pastor is saying, I am equipping you, I am empowering you, the gifts that were deposited on the inside of you that was predestined before time, you must do what God has called you to do. Our pastor has been preaching about it's the year of acceleration. It's the year of promotion. I am coming up underneath that message and I'm saying, I am declaring, I receive, and I am walking in the year of promotion. But may we never forget to trim our wick because you don't know if you have enough oil until you go to trim your wick. May God use you mightily. May you do something to shake this city, to shake this community, to shake your jobs. And may the oil and the fire of God go where you go. And so, Lord, we repent in this place. Lord, we repent, God, for just going through the the motions. Being average, being common, being complacent, waiting for someone to call me out. But Lord, you've been calling me out since January 1. And I will not hide anymore. I will not be hiding anymore. But God, we will respond to you. Lord, we thank you for your word. That you are cutting away right now at the sound of my voice, Lord. Those who got some char tops, (laughs) Lord, you're just cutting away right now. So, God, that we can burn brighter, and, God, that we can burn longer, God. This kingdom does not need any more preachers, any more evangelists, any more pastors to burn out out of sin, God. But we have got to stay grounded in you. And, God, may our wick be soaked in oil. I don't know who 